phenomenal results of Besson Gregor Lo to uh, the foliated category. So that in the foliated situation, this is a non compact. Uh, uh, so this is a sort of a non compact setting, whereas um, Besson Gregor Lo worked with compact manifolds. So there's been different developments in that direction. So let me just introduce first some what foliations are, uh, foliated spaces. Grab. Better here. So here we have a space X is a topological space, um, and we'll assume it's compact. And this, so usually foliations, when we say foliations, it's a manifold. Um, some people call this a laminated space. That is confusing because other people, low-dimensional topologists, use it in a very narrow sense. Um, so foliated spaces, the Campbell group of foliators tend to use this terminology. So here we're using foliation in the sense of having a uh, boy, let's see there, uh, having a decomposition of the space X into a bunch of leaves, and so the leaves are uh, have a certain property, and every time you have a so maybe X looks like this. And the leaves look like this, so I have my space X decomposed into a disjoint union of leaves, and then the extra requirement has to do with having a covering of the space such that each piece, which we sometimes call a flow box or a foliation box, foliated chart, this should be a product, so it should be a countable covering, and each UI should be homeomorphic to some transversal space. Um, and this is, in this setting, it's just a topological space. In the case of a foliated manifold, this itself would be a, a disk. And then cross some disk of dimension n. All right, so maybe I'll make it more clear. Zero, one to the n. So n will be the dimension of the foliation. So the dimension of the leaves. All right. OK. So there should also be compatibility of charts. Compatibility. So plus some compatibility on the charts and overlaps, as usual, for similar to bundle theory. So this is a foliated space, and we're going to be dealing in this category today. So first, I want to go through some uh, notions that are essential for general theory of entropy rigidity. So of course, we have entropy, but I'm going to generalize this a little bit. So I'll call it entropy plus to indicate that we're taking a different uh, supremum than normal. So normally, the entropy of a, of a space, so if I had a uh, manifold here, so maybe I should write M for manifold, MG money manifold. Then, ah, uh, get another here. Um, let's see, let's see if this works better. So, if I have a Ramani manifold, then we normally define the entropy of G as a limb soup of the log of the volume of a ball in the universal cover. So, BXR, ball radius R. in M tilde, in the universal cover of M. And we just take the limb soup as Argos infinity. And this would be the entropy, uh, volume growth entropy. So this is the volume growth. Ah, this is not the greatest piece of chalk either. Eventually, I'll find a smooth piece of chalk. So the volume growth entropy is normally defined this way. So notice I take the limb soup here because if, if it's a compact, if it's a co-compact manifold, there's a manifold with a compact quotient, then I wouldn't need to take the soup. It's a theorem of Manning and such. So there's all kinds of things. This doesn't depend on x. That's triangle inequality, uh, et cetera. So this is independent of x. But in the non-compact setting, there's some problems with this. So this is not well adapted to all situations. Um, 
it's useful oftentimes to have a slightly larger notion of entropy which agrees, and we're going to use that today. So I want to define h bar of g to be. So this doesn't depend on x after taking limb soup, but it does depend on x, of course, inside the limb soup. And if I take the limb soup as r goes to infinity of a soup over x in m tilde of log, this is the volume, volume dxr, then this is slightly larger. However, this actually agrees um, with the entropy if it's a co-compact space. So for m, m tilde having compact quotient, um, generally if it's just tiled, uh, tiled uniformly, kind of coarsely tiled uniformly, that's enough. Um, Co-compact action, that's fine. Then this h bar is actually the same as h. So it is, it is a strict generalization. Uh, it has some slightly more useful properties, though, for dealing with things. So in a foliation, you can have a leaf which really goes in all kinds of places. Foliate spaces are, in a sense, quasi-tiled because if, if it's of a compact space, a leaf is bound to stay inside that compact space and it can't move. So the, it limits on other leaves and things like that. However, you could have a situation where, for example, a leaf with a metric limited on different leaves and different parts of it with different curvature bounds, for example. And so this forces it to pick out the area of highest growth inside the leaf. And that's the key difference um, between this one and this entropy. All right. So now I have to define a couple more things before actually stating the main theorem. Um, so the foliated version of entropy ah. Maybe I'm not holding this quite right, but uh, the foliated entropy is a notion that I want to assign globally to the space. I want to have the, an entropy that reflects the entropy of the leaves but is a global average. So for that, first I need to come up with a, a measure on the global space. So this is standard that given a transverse measure, so here each of these TIs form a global transversal if I put them together. Oh, sorry for all the scratches. Um, I can put these transversals together for this covering. So I have a covering everywhere, and there's another one. And I just take the collection of those together. Um, it's certainly not a situation where each leaf intersects only one transversal at one point. In fact, one leaf, it might be that every leaf is dense, right? Like an irrational foliation on the torus, which most of you have probably seen. So there, one leaf might intersect every single transversal densely. Um, so it's not meant to be a one-to-one -one sort of thing. So for foliate entropy, I needed to find a global measure on x. So to do that, I start with a transverse measure. So choose, choose a transverse invariant measure, so it's whatever that is. Ah, yeah, let me try another. <laughs> Let's try this. Ah, that's nice and smooth. Ah, okay. Choose a transverse invariant measure, explain what that is. New on T. So in a situation like this, there's a holonomy, which is naturally defined, and it's kind of clear what it should be if I have So if I have a sequence of flow boxes going from here along here to this final one, I can define for a sufficiently small open set, as long as this is not too far away, I mean, the further away it is, I'm going to make this smaller, I can translate this along leaves. So I just, for every point here, I follow the leaf until it ends at a point there. And that gives me a different set over here that's just the the uh, saturation by leaves, and I just look at the intersection with this part of the transversal, and that's a holonomy map to here. And the collection of all such maps, some of them you can compose, some of them you can't, so they form a pseudogroup, the holonomy pseudogroup. So this is a measure that's invariant under the holonomy pseudogroup. In other words, um, if whatever the measure says this set is, it better be the same as what that set is. Now, unlike this suggested by this picture, these don't always exist, and the reason is because 
Like in a compact set, there's lots of ways of coming back to yourself. And you might come in yourself in such a way that you can't possibly have the same measure. So um, these tend to exist in many, many situations, but not always. For what I'm discussing, um, I'll present the theorems for transverse invariant measures, but I'll mention that in many situations, in many, I'll indicate a few of the theorem, in, in particular that I'm going to present theorems, in many situations, a, a quasi-invariant variant nu is good enough. But not always. It depends on how bad the map is, actually, that I'm going to be using. So here, a quasi-invariant measure is just one where the, the under, under holonomy translations, the measure class is preserved instead of the actual value. These always exist. For example, harmonic measures always exist by the theorem of uh, Lucy Garnett. OK. Uh, E.g. harmonic. Harmonic measures. Transverse harmonic measures okay, are examples that always exist. Uh, OK, these always exist. In other words, that wouldn't impose, this would impose you know, some restriction on what x could be. This does not. OK, so given that situation, we can build a global measure mu, and I called, uh, I called that x. Um, so I could build a global measure mu x that is just uh, locally, so locally. It's just nu cross, uh, so d nu cross uh, dg on each leaf. So I just look at the Riemannian measures on each leaf product with the, with the uh, transverse measure nu, and that gives me a measure on product sets. And even though it's not a global product, this measure is a global measure. OK, so that's, that's the global measure. So that's, in other words, a finite measure, assuming nu is finite, finite measure on x. And it's interesting measure. It's the foliation measure, really, because it's, it's the Riemannian measure on the leaves, right? So you want to somehow incorporate those in that way. OK, so given that, um, what is the foliate entropy? So for the foliation on the space x, the foliate entropy is just you know, xx. The average, so that's, I mean, that's the total mass. And I average over x, and I just have h bar. So I'm using h bar here, uh, l, well, OK, lx d mu. I guess I can subscript the mu if I want to indicate which space it pertains to. So later on, we'll have two foliations, and so I'll need to index it. So I might as well do that now. OK, so this is the, the average value of the entropies on the leaves, is the foliate entropy for this result. OK, this is not the, uh, not the geese walsack or langevin walsack type. So I should probably call this uh, maybe foliated volume growth entropy. To distinguish it from this one, this entropy has, um, is also extremely interesting entropy. Uh, it, it somehow pertains to more, uh, more transverse data. It combines the holonomy group void in a different way. So it's, it's really telling you different information. This, this sort of emphasizes the leaf, the tangential aspect of the entropy, whereas this is much more the transversal, how the how this holonomy pseudo group uh, exponentially grows on a net, for example. So it's in more close to the topological entropy. This is a, really a strictly a volume growth entropy. OK, so having said that, I want to now the, there's an incredibly interesting link between this and this, which I believe could lead to other type of uh, entropy regime results incorporating these both, which would have other global consequences. But that's for another day. OK, so that's the fully entropy. And now I need to tell you about foliated degree of a map. So this is an interesting concept that I looked everywhere. I expected that there would be a foliated degree theory 
Um, I see why there's not now. I think I understand more or less why um, why it hasn't come up. It's maps, foliated maps just aren't, there's not a lot of uh, results about them in general, um, so there's just not much in the literature. Uh, Steve Herter has some things where he talks about it, some, a few other cases that we found. And, uh, oh, I should, by the way, say this is all work with uh, Zhen Yu Li. And later, maybe, I'll get to talk about stuff with um, Matilda Martinez. So uh, this, this I may or may not have time to talk about, actually. But I'll at least try to give an advertisement. OK. So fully to degree, this is a notion which is not an integer, uh, but it's built to be sort of a topological homotopy invariant leaf-wise. And so what is this? Um, I have to define the degree here so I can define it this way. Um, degree of f of the foliation x of a map f. So here, f should be a foliated continuous map between two foliated, map, two foliated spaces. Uh, foliated spaces. And it should be a foliation preserving map. So this is a foliated map, which just means you send leaf to leaf, right? So that's obvious what it should be. Um, however, you may send many leaves to one leaf. And uh, you could, of course, you know, just and then on each leaf, you can be any sort of map uh, you can imagine. So here, I'm going to insist that this be a proper foliated map. And in fact, you need it to be leafwise proper. So it turns out that just because these are compact, of course, that makes f as a continuous map proper. But it does not make it leafwise proper. Um, simple examples, you can wrap leaves, uh, you can wrap a non-compact leaf uh, onto a compact leaf, for example, easily in each simple example. So, so you need to actually assume this separately. It doesn't follow for free. OK. But given a leaf-wise proper map, you need proper maps to define degree theory, right? Because you're using locally finite homology or Borel-Moore homology, whichever you want, um, or cohomology with compact supports. Same thing. It's dual. So here, I'm going to integrate. Again, I'm actually integrate over the right-hand side. So now I'm going to use the measure on the right-hand side. And I have to tell you a little bit about what this measure is built from. Okay. Um, degree. Yeah, restricted to um, LT. Okay, so the integrals are going to look kind of scary throughout the talk. Um, try to just listen to me. I'm going to explain what they mean morally, because this is one thing about foliation theory is that the, the integration, everything is, you're decomposing into uh, you know, measures along using the decomposition theorem all the time. Um, and you have to do this because maps in general, continuous maps, can be really bad on leaves. So in fact, some things I'm not even going to write down they are so bad. But I will try to explain this. So here I'm looking at the transversal. I take the pre-image of a leaf. That might be many leaves, and it might intersect the transversal in many places. However, um, I can take a conditional measure for the transverse measure on that tr transversal, conditional with respect to the, to the right-hand side, parametrizing by a flow box on the right-hand side. And then the inner part here is what's important. So I'm doing an average over mu n, and I'll explain what mu n is uh, a little bit. I haven't really explained it because I haven't told you what the nu should be on the n side. I'm starting with a new on the m side, and I'll explain what this is. So let me just first tell you what the degree is here. Again, that's just the degree. So again, when I have a proper map, this is going to be proper on the leaf. Um, so that's just, again, the ordinary degree. Ordinary degree, which is just, you know, you take the multiplicity of s star on hn locally finite homology of that leaf to the image leaf. So homology with just locally finite homology here on LFX. That's non-zero. The locally finite just means it's z at the top dimension, just like it would be for a compact manifold. Um, and of course, this agrees with it in the compact case, the ordinary homology. And so then you just take the degree of the multiplicity of the fundamental class um, or the degree of that map, 
uh, as a linear map, right? So that's the degree. And I'm averaging this. So it turns out, uh, well, I have to tell you what I'm averaging over. So for m, m here is now going to play the role of x. So we start with, start with nu on m, or t, the transversal to get get mu m, and then, then use a push forward the analog of a push forward nu prime on, uh, on t prime in n. Okay. So there's not a push forward because there's different transversals, and the transversals don't go to transversals under f. In fact, it's pretty bad. Um, they end up being, I mean, you can measurably kind of mash them onto F. But the problem is that uh, you can have various things happen. For example, many leaves, uh, F sends many leaves to one, to one. That's easy to deal with, that problem. Um, the harder problem is the following. I can have a plaque. So these, if I take a flow box and intersect it with a leaf, that's a plaque. So I could have um, something like this. A big piece of a leaf gets sent to one plaque in a flow box. This is a flow box in M, and here's a flow box in N. And this could get sent into one plaque, like so. So this just gets sent to that little one plaque. Um, the dual problem can occur as well. You could have one plaque here get sent to get sent to something like that. Okay, so you can have one plaque get sent to many plaques. So these both cause problems when you're looking at the multiplicity. On top of that, you have to deal with the ordinary degree, the analytic degree issue. If I take a point here, again, it could have many preimages, maybe three on this plaque, two on that plaque, and two there. Okay, so. Let me just explain to you, those are the three problems you have to deal with. And you can put them together, and you can deal with them each one by one, actually, in a formula. And new prime exists. You have to do all this decomposition, which I'm not going to. You would hate me if I wrote down new prime, so I'm not going to do it. Uh, I don't have time either. Uh, also, so you can just look at the paper. So this is new prime. Um, new prime deals with this. So if you do it correctly, count, count properly you get new prime from new. So we want to count transversally properly uh, in the right way using, so if I have the measure here, I can build a measure here transversally that um, somehow reflects what the push forward should be for a foliation, OK, in a foliated map. So it depends on this map, of course, just like push forwards. So this is the right push forward. So that's what new prime is, and so use new prime as the transversal measure to get mu sub n. OK, so, so nu, uh, start with nu to get mu sub m, and use nu prime to get mu sub n. Transver uh, tangentially, it's just the Riemannian measure, of course, the volume measure on the leaves. So that gives us the global measure. And that's what this measure here I'm using. And that's just a conditional measure for nu. OK, so uh, let me just give a quick example, maybe to show you what in the world this thing is. So this is not an integer, unlike a regular degree. So here's a simple example. Um, here's a foliated space. Just take a couple circles. And I want to make it connected. I'm always talking about connected situation. So I map this to itself. Degree three here, degree two here, and so I want to make it connected. So I, I can do this by making a spring coil. So here's a copy of R, and I have R map onto itself at different rates, so that it ends up being limiting to degree two here and limiting to degree three here, and that makes it globally continuous. And here it turns out, so because it's two here, if I put the transverse measure nu 
um, knew I could make one here, one here, drac on this circle, drac on this circle, and then the, uh, the degree for this foliation and this map um, is five hats, for example. So you don't need it to be an integer. All right. I think I'm ready to state everything. Yep. OK. So suppose n is foliated by locally symmetric spaces, so again, the, the particular group, the fundamental group can vary from leaf to leaf um, on n. And this is a compact again, so everything's compact here. The total spaces are compact. And M is arbitrary here, except compact. Nu is transverse invariant again. And suppose F foliated from M to M. Again, it's always uh, leafwise proper. C0 has the property that whenever, whenever degree of f restricted Lx is not 0, then I require that the entropy of that leaf at least be, the volume growth entropy be positive. OK. I'll explain why I may not have to have this. Um, we weren't able to prove that this always follows. It's a very delicate problem, actually, relating to transverse, how the tangential structure forces itself on the transverse structure. So, um, and you certainly don't need this. You don't need this in many cases, so I'll mention that a little bit later. Uh, so the statement is then that H, the foliated entropy um, of M to the nth power times the volume, the mu M, just like in the besson de Lowe theorem, this is big and equal to the absolute value of the degree, foliated degree of f times the entropy, foliated entropy on n to the nth power and uh, times the volume, mu n of n. Okay. And equality implies um, new, new every, so that means in the support every leaf of M in support of nu is homothetic. To its image. OK, and the homothetic can be, you know, if you just scale the whole thing. Um, Actually, the homothetic, depending on whether the foliation is ergodic, you, may, you can take each ergodic component of the foliation. So now there's not a global ergodic. I'm not assuming the foliation is globally ergodic, whatever that means, for those who don't know um, what that should mean. The, uh, on each ergodic component, you can scale separately, and then you get uh, iso isometry between the leaves. So let me make a few comments off the bat that um, there are restrictions on, if, if I have a space that's uh, foliated by locally symmetric spaces, there are restrictions that are somehow imposed by this. I mean, there's, first of all, Zimmer theory even for measurable foliations. But um, in the rank one, it's not as, uh, oh, sorry, this is uh, rank one. <laughs> Higher rank hasn't been done yet. Rank one locally symmetric spaces. So negative curvature in particular. So there are restrictions here. That imposes, so in the equality case, then you would get some global topological restrictions on M, because M would also be foliated by locally symmetric spaces, for example. Uh, what else? So there's various other things. Uh, let me point out a couple of things right off the bat for this theorem. So the, you can drop the condition on entropy in many situations that the entropy be positive when the degree is not equal to 0 on a leaf. Um, so 
So first of all, if, uh, if F is coarse equivalence on leaf, equivalence on leaves, e.g. this happens if F is a homotopy, homotopy equivalence um, just on the global level, right? If it's just a plain homotopy equivalence between the complex spaces M and N, then that automatically, it turns out the holonomy groupoid, you can just transport that over and it implies using that that they're coarsely equivalent and then that's, that's enough to get uh, quasi isometry. So that's due to my, you can find that in Herder, for example. Herder's work on qua, uh, coarse equivalence affiliations. So this uh, also implies in that case, um, in that case, for example, in fact, the weaker case and many others. Many, in fact, every example I can think of, I can prove that you don't need this condition here. Okay. And in particular, you don't need it in the trivial case of a trivial foliation, and that's exactly uh, based on the Glow's theorem for the entropy rigidity. Uh, many others, no need for a box condition. Anyway, it's, it's actually not such a bad condition. You can just check in any, any example that you would cook up. Uh, and by the way, foliations come up in many examples. Um, of course, you have the ones from geometry and Nossov structures, uh, anything you're you're doing where you're looking at the up and up decompositions of maps, you get foliations. Um, not always continuous, though. This is a continuous foliation. But in many, many other situations, of course, you have, uh, you can do suspensions of things, suspensions of maps, and um, like something like take a, take, a, take a symmetric space X cross some other space that gamma, gamma is a lattice in X. If gamma acts on this, then you can do X mod X cross B mod gamma, that's a compact space, but the leaves don't necessarily close up because, because you know, the, the parameter here might change. So this is, a, this is the diagonal action, so it doesn't mean that these all close up, right? They can be, in fact, completely non-compactly embedded. All right, so this is a, maybe the most common way in which foliations are kind of artificially built, but, but they come up naturally all over the place. All right. And they tell you something topologically about the space as well, what sort of foliations arise. Incredibly important even in surfaces, of course, in technical theory, train tracks and all that business. So uh, that was a lot of the motivation. There's some uh, several corollaries of this business as well. Uh, is there anything else I want to say, actually? Make a comment. Yeah, I guess that's it for now. Okay. So applications. So as Probably most of you maybe know um, Besson and had uh, several applications of their entropy rigidity result, and we have analogs for most of those, except for I don't have analogs yet of the dynamical ones directly. Well, there is an analog of foliation dynamics, but not the geodesic flow. Oh, there is one analog of that. Sorry, uh, analogs for most. I'll just leave it at that. Um, of their applications, not their most recent ones, just their older applications. So, for example, there's a min-vol, foliated min-vol theorem, entropy, uh, sorry, min-vol rigidity. Uh, leaves are, I won't, I won't even try to explain this, but uh, Einstein metrics on Einstein four-dimensional 4D metrics on leaves. This one's actually interesting because to get this one, you have to do some uh, cone theory. You have to use some of Alan Cohn's stuff on uh, C star algebras. Uh, well, the foliated version of that. So, uh, foliations are an example of C star algebras from the groupoid. And you have to do some non-trivial stuff there uh, and general things. And by the way, I should say that, plus several others, uh, I should say that this result was early. There's an early version. Years ago, I mean, a, a simpler, so a much weaker version, I should say, much weaker, uh, due to myself and Boland, Jeff Boland. And I, for years, wanted to generalize that, um, but I didn't have the technology, and there's a couple things that I worked out with uh, Jamu, and we actually were able to figure out how to do this. So it turned out to be a lot more technically complicated with the measure theory and such. Okay. 
And the key part is this, the problem with the non-compactness. So not, compactness is a central part of the argument, um, especially with the properness. And now with uh, Juan Suto and Jeff Bull and myself, we worked out the uh, finite volume version early on. That's, um, that was the final version was done by Pete Storm. And there, uh, you have to do various tricks to deal with the non-compactness. But that's sort of a different type of non-compactness where you have a cusps. And the cusps can be controlled because of their size being very small. Here, we have very large non-compactness. But we have this sort of recurrence with the tiling. And you have to have something, by the way. Theorems like this just not even true. You don't even have degree theory. Um, so you, you use the ideas to use this tiling, which is a very poor tiling. I mean, you sort of have different scales. It's not like a uniform tiling. You don't have quasi-isometry between leaves whatsoever. But you sort of have different, at different scales, you have different quasi-symmetric images um, of large pieces, any finitely large piece. So that's the sort of game that we have to play for this. And I won't be able to give you a full description of that in the time I have, but I'll try to give you a picture of one, argue, one part of the argument uh, for this. OK, any questions with that so far? Okay. So let me continue on and mention the second theorem, um, which is the analog of the real Schwartz lemma. So once you figured out the non compactness issues, this was fairly easy to do this as well, uh, especially using the work from the finite volume case kind of knew how to do this. So this is the real Schwartz lemma, foliated. Real Schwartz lemma. And so here, uh, again, F, same, same setup. I won't write everything down again. Is in the first theorem, except now N, except N, is now foliated by Nagley curve leaves. And you assume the curvature of each leaf is um, at most minus 1. So you just normalize to be most minus 1. And on M, M you assume that the Ricci curvature of the leaves. minus n minus 1, the metric tensor. So the Ricci tensor is, I mean, positive definite inequality there for positive definite forms. And this is the setup. So you just kind of normalize the curvatures of the domain and target away from each other, except here you only assume Ricci. And then you get the statement that the volume. So we can estimate, basically, this allows you to estimate the entropies and so you can just leave the volumes and the volume, foliated volume here of n. Uh, that's mu. Well, the, with respect to the measure, so just mu m of m and uh, times the degree. Foliated degree of f. And equality implies both sides hyperbolic, both sides of hyperbolic leaves. Now, we're not insisting on non compactness, of course. Again, there's, these are just locally symmetric on the right, or, um, or you know, the leaves could be anything in this situation. So they could be closed leaves, mixed, closed, and open leaves, et cetera. All right. So I wanted to say a little bit how to prove this. Um, let me present the key ideas. Um, yeah, some of the applications use the second theorem, not not just the first theorem. Okay. 
So we want to use the best on the low map. And the idea is that, uh, the very center method in general, that given this continuous map, leafwise proper, uh, I can induce a measurable map. So leafwise, uh, leafwise C1, here we go. C1 measurable map, globally measurable. And later, after the fact, so a posteriori, you get that it's nicer than this, but uh, a priori, it's just measurable in the construction. And the way it works is, really, it's a family of maps. So here, if I have a leaf, I do it leafwise. I can start with a point x in a leaf, which I'll parameterize by the point that the leaf goes through. And I can embed this leaf into space of probability measures. I can normalize the probability on the universal cover of the leaf by taking x to the measure, which is just e to the minus s distance x comma dot dg. So I just take the Ramani measure in this measure in the class of the Ramani measure just by having a decaying bump function, right? So exponentially decaying bump function around the point x in the leaf. So I embed it into its own universal cover. Well, I've got a lift here, so I'm kind of brushing over that issue as well. So this is on the universal cover of the leaf. And map it over by push forwards uh, into I guess the lift of f, little f, to probably measures over here. And then I use the very center construction to get into into that leaf, okay, in the target space. This is inside N, that's inside M. And that induces a map, okay, going around the circle. And the important point is this map has lots of beautiful properties. Uh, it actually goes, I mean, it, the history of this goes way back. Um, people, uh, is it Weizenbach, uh, not Weizenbach, uh, who is it? Uh, say again? Uh, well, well, Furstenberg, Furstenberg, but, but before Furstenberg, there was the Berry Center methods were around in, uh, in just harmonic analysis. People use this, and, and uh, there was a there's a very old metric. And I'm trying to remember who it's by. It's uh, maybe Weinberg, Weinberg metric, um, where you can actually build a metric on space of probability measures using a Berry Center such, and, and it has beautiful properties. So I, I recommend everyone to look into that. Um, it, it's really very functorially nice too, in a, in a categorical sense. Okay, so this map. Um, gives us a nice map. It turns out this can be promoted to a C1 map. Uh, it's, it's parameterized by that value S. So here I didn't say what S was. S has to be bigger than the entropy. And I'm going to insist on the, this entropy, this kind of entropy plus, the soup entropy, soup over X entropy of the leaf X. Okay. So you require that that be bigger. And you'll take a limit. So we'll take a limit later where S gets closer and closer. Well, in the theory, actually, the way you do it is you actually just say, we'll say S has to, can be at least this close, and then we'll do some uniform estimates. And so there's a game we play with this as well. So this gives us a leafwise map. And you can show it's, you can show that because of the way this converges, actually, this gives you the homotopy automatically. It gives you, if, if we can show that this is proper, then it's not too much harder to show that there's a proper homotopy between this map and F. In fact, by running S through a, a leafwise proper homotopy by running S through parameters from, say, um, 0 to the entropy. So you start with kind of, or rather, sorry, infinity, infinity going down to the entropy. So at infinity, this becomes like a Dirac measure. And if you run through this game, you get back the original map, little f. OK, so I should say S equals infinity, fs equals. OK, wow, OK, we got to get going here. So I want to tell you some of the steps that are required. So that's how you get started in the business. But the key problem occurs at every stage, every single stage, you have this problem with the non-compactness that you have to fight through. So I want to at least give you one sense of one key step in the properness, which is a key problem. But it turns out there are other ones that rear their head as well. Uh, so you have.
show f is proper, f leapwise proper. to get proper homotopy. Uh, it's homotopic. Homotopic to F. That allows us to, that's where the fully degree comes into play, because that's the leaf proper leafwise homotopy invariant. And then we need to also uh, look at a fully degree formula. This was a bear. This was uh, this is where failed attempts at this were were in different counterexamples using really successively nastier maps f that you could have that we thought oh you couldn't have this and then realized that, oh yeah potentially you could have that happen and then you get worse and worse so that's what led us down to the uh, the path of how to actually construct a new prime so that's another story um, you have to get just that that new prime is exactly what makes this work so to have a fully decorated form in the sense of Federer. And uh, lastly, I guess we had um, well, the BCG estimate finally doing everything. So the BCG estimate inequality, putting it all together to get this inequality. And then the equality case, uh, the rigidity conclusions in equal case. Okay. I'll say a little bit about this. Uh, in the equality case, you can get stuff locally about using kind of minimax properties. You'll get, um, you can get local rigidity, but then you have to deal with some you kind of run down to through ergodic components of the foliation to, to kind of get the rigidity on blocks measurably. So you get like new almost every leaf is isometric, iso in the end, um, isometric. But then by the transverse continuity, you can finally get that you have to be um, equality, at least on the support of new. So I should have said that. Um, both sides hyperbolic leaves. This is on the support of new a new prime on the, on the right, which is basically the push forward of that support. Uh, you can't say anything. You could have a measure, for example, that's just zero on big chunks of the foliation. So you can never say anything about that part, of course. Okay. Well, I want to talk a little bit about this. Um, what's going on there? So in the first step, the real big problem. is after starting with this map, little f, which is leafwise proper, so it's really nice. You know, a sequence, an infinite sequence going out to infinity along a leaf, which of course then inside m just wraps around. When you map over to n, because of leafwise proper, it also goes out to infinity in the leaf in n. But that's not necessarily the case with fs. Um, so here we want to show some sequence marching out to infinity. Doesn't do this doesn't have some limit point in the image. And the way you run through this is to look at big balls. So the first part, uh, we use a key lemma in our work with Juan Suto and Jeff Boland. Uh, so one thing in this theory that's implicit is Patterson-Sullivan theory is sort of everywhere in the background. But you never quite get Patterson-Sullivan theory because of the generality. But in a Negley curve case, for example, these limit to if you normalize. Oh, yeah, I have to normalize. Normalize by the mass. Then these, in some, if you choose things carefully, uh, the right limits for S, for example, then as S goes down to the entropy, these become the patterson sullivan measures on the boundary of L and L hats. OK, so if you know what that is, then you may be able to understand what I'm saying there. So the key lemma, though, that applies is an estimate of how the barycenter, which I didn't have, don't even have time to quite describe, but I'll, I'll say basically if you, have a, if you have a measure, what is this last step? You have some sort of measure. And I want to take a mean um, of this measure and find where its center of mass is, so that if I put my finger on the plate and there is that much weight on it, it's where the point where it would balance. And because of convexity here, this is being non-positively non curved, is only, well, for weak convexity. This is negatively curved, so there is a unique point, a unique minimum, where that occurs. Okay. So in this key lemma, let's state this. Um, 
Okay, so let's get the quantifiers right. So there exists a D global such that um, for lambda, I guess I call it lambda. Lambda, and I convolve and sigma lambda its convolution with visual measures. on boundary L infinity. So I just write f of x. This is the negatively curved leaf on the target space inside n. So that's the leaf in n. So that's negatively curved. So there's a boundary in infinity, the Gromov boundary. And for the, if you convolve lambda with the visual measures, the patterson solid measures on the boundary to get sigma lambda, then one thing you can do is for any, actually I need to guess, I'm going to use 9 tenths here. Um, so then if, if k is a compact set, and lambda of k is bigger than 9 tenths of the mass of lambda, then the barycenter of sigma lambda you can also deal with the very center of a mass and infinity. Um, there's a version of this where these don't have to be involved with the visual measures at infinity, but this is the form that was given to us in, that we worked with in Bowen Connell Suto. So then this very center is within D of K. Okay, so in other words, if I have this property that this compact set has large lambda measure, then the barycenter doesn't, the barycenter of, after convolving with these measures of infinity, this doesn't stay too far, doesn't stray too far from that set K. Okay, so that's a key thing. Um, in other words, it doesn't, it's, this is uniform. The key thing here is that this, this D is associated to 9 tenths. <laughs> 9 tenths doesn't change. So it doesn't matter the position in the space um, where where lambda, whereas k is. So it doesn't matter where k is in L, uh, it's always going to be within D of that set k. So if I have k here, then, and lambda is mostly supported on k, then after convolving with this, these measures on the sphere of infinity, they balance out so that the very center of that new convolved measure, which is something like this. You should think of that being, um, sorry, that should be, that's like the push forward over here. So think of this as like lambda. Maybe that would be lambda, and then the push forward it lives over here. Okay, so that's the sigma lambda is sort of what gets pushed over by this. Um, this thing is going to be there, so that's the very center of sigma lambda. So the center of mass doesn't stray too far from the set K. So the fact that it's uniform means it doesn't matter where K is, how far out um, in some direction of this really strange manifold K is. Okay. And this isn't nearly enough, it turns out. Um, What we can do is say the following claim. So I'm going to make a claim here. It's a little bit technical. Um, so for all x in the universal cover of the leaf L, this is on uh, the m side. This is in m. OK, so I claim that there is an r. Um, so I have to say. Yeah, I have to tell you what RSX is first. Let me write this out. RSX, let this be the largest R, such that the volume of BXR divided by R, the log, this is bigger than or equal to S. So remember that the entropy, this is strictly bigger than H bar. H bar is the limb soup of this as R goes to infinity after I soup over the possible Xs, right? All possible Xs. So eventually, 
eventually this has to get below S if S is strictly bigger than H bar. Okay, so eventually that has to decrease. So I can take the largest, for that X, I can take, and that S, I can take the largest R for which this is still um, bigger than or equal to S. And then later on, if, for all future ones, it has to eventually get below that point. So if I do that, so the claim is that um, this is bounded, that for all X, uh, RSX is bounded. So it's bigger than or equal to some R of S particular. Okay. So that uniform bound, eventually you can make that statement into a fact that you're going to use the ball of radius R here, R of S, to be the universal compact set. It, 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 it'll be located in different places, but it has uniform diameter, right? So the idea is that eventually that will be the set that I look at, no matter where it is, the barycenter lies near it. So in other words, if on, in L here, if L, these points march off to infinity, that forces the barycenter also to march off to infinity because the compact set will be marching off to infinity because it's not getting bigger and bigger. Like, if it got bigger and bigger and bigger, this ball of radius, depending on where it's centered at, then it could be so big that it actually comes back to a common neighborhood you know, near some origin point. And then that could be a limit point. But if it marches off to infinity as well, which it's forced to do, then you're fine. And so that's the key idea. Um, actually, this is a... Yeah, a bit of a nasty thing. Let me try to explain what's going on with this, uh, how actually we get this bounded. And the key thing is that we do an integration by parts argument. So let me just write that down. Um, yeah, I'll say it this way. Um, yeah, I'll just, I'll just compute it. Mu S. So let, let this, uh, let's sigma s y n. This is the measure after it's pushed forward onto the measures of the target leaf, OK, based on the measure that's centered at that point y n. So y n will be, say, these points y n. And that's the measure that's inside the probably measures on the target leaf um, p l. The yn are in one leaf, so that's actually the same leaf. So I'm looking at the probability measures in there. And I can actually do a computation and compute this directly. So um, what I'll do is I'll look at the, the first measure, which I call the lambda. So I'll, I'll just do lambda s y n, that computation first, on the ball of radius uh, b x b y n r y n. Yn. So this is going to be equal to, um, it's normalized, so it's 1 over the integral on the whole leaf of e to the minus s b y n dot, and then the dg, and then integral on just the ball. And after doing, after realizing that this is radial in its distance, right, so this is a radial function, so I can change coordinates and then integrate by parts. So after polar, polar chords and integrate by parts, I can break up this integral into the integral over the ball plus the leftover stuff. So it actually looks like this. It's um, 0 to R Y N S uh, e to the minus s t. And then there's a times some constant that's coming from the volume form on the sphere divided by the integral from 0 to rn, rsyn, of the same thing plus the integral to infinity. Um, to infinity. OK. And the key thing is that this part we can estimate. Um, so how am I going to explain that? Let's just do it this way. Let's just compute this. So here I have integral. I better do it on the next board. Let's see. I started. OK, good. I have maybe a minute. So for any epsilon, see, 
um, sufficiently small where that means less than the gap between h bar and s, then I know I can get an estimate on this, how fast this decays. So there exists a C for which that point, um, yeah, I have to say this, so for which uh, R S minus epsilon Y N is less than or equal to C. Okay. Just because that limit is bigger, so I can do that. And then I can just estimate this integral directly um, from infinity R into infinity. R Y N S minus epsilon to infinity, and it just becomes uh, S. This is less than or equal to, let me just write this down here. Uh, yeah, that integral is less than or equal to the integral from R Y N to infinity of S minus epsilon times e to the minus uh, S minus ep uh, epsilon T. The ST part cancels. Um, the, the volume growth is exponential. So it, its exponential rate is, in, is less than S. It's actually H bar is the exponential rate. And so what happens is that cancels the ST, leaving an epsilon, the difference between these two left over. And that's what this is. And so this becomes less than or equal to, after integrating S minus epsilon over epsilon, E to the minus epsilon C. And the point is that this goes to 0 as C goes to infinity. So in other words, this part of the integral here, uh, for, I can make it as small as I want. So in other words, I can make it just, but uniformly, so I'm not going to take it to 0. I just make it small enough so that this divided by itself is as close as you want, say, less than, uh, sorry, uh, greater than or equal to 9 tenths. OK, so I make that just uniformly small enough so this is bigger than or equal to 9 tenths. And then that gives us the 9 tenths. So now that measure, that set, uh, Rsx is uniform bound, uh, R, R of s rather, the uniform bound independent of x, is the size of set. And here k has to be convex. I didn't say that. That's important. Yeah, sorry, I forgot to say that. So balls are convex. That's about one of the few convex sets you know exist even in general negligible curve manifolds in general. And we know that the measure, um, the measure has, has a, uh, mass 9 tenths on that. And then that's what actually ends up being our set. And then our barycenter ends up being close to that set k. And that gives us this, this uh, uniformity um, that gives us the properness of the map f leafwise. You have to do lots more work than you know, a little more work to get that it's, that it's proper homotopic leafwise. And it continues on. Um, there's many other steps, but I just want to give you a flavor of how you can deal with non-compactness using the estimates from Patterson-Sullivan theory. OK. Thank you very much. Yes. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. So the foliations are right. I, I should have said that, yeah. A priori, you could have maybe bigger leaves collapsing onto smaller leaves. I, I meant to indicate that with the n. The n on both sides, h to the n, is the same. Oh, oh, no, no, right. The leaves are the same dimension. So you don't have to assume the manifolds are of the same dimension. Yeah. Yeah, actually, it's probably going to be uh, is it automatically 0. No, not necessarily. Actually, it's conceivable. Yeah, that's a good question. I should think of some examples. Um, it might be that it just ends up being 0 in that case, and so that it sort of vanishes, you know. Uh, it's trivial. Inequality is trivially satisfied. There's never equality. Um, so you don't have rigidity. But uh, actually, it's really more about the leaves that matter. So actually, I don't really see that there would be a problem. Uh, it would just be that, oh, yeah, actually, here's what would happen. You'd probably have a the transverse measure. Like, if the if domain was bigger dimension, you might have bigger stacks of leaves collapsing. And then you just have equivalence on all the leaves simultaneously, if the, whenever the foliated degree is 1, for example. Uh, so that could happen, actually. So that's an example that yeah, could happen. I, I, did, yeah, I remember I did think of that case. Uh, if the domain is smaller dimension than the target, uh, I'd have to really think about what happened there. But it might be that the push forward measure has just areas where it's zero. So it's only maybe small in a, on a small area. Because the fact that this is trans, especially if it's transverse invariant, then the image, um, in that case, there's, uh, there's more transverse topological requirements that have to be satisfied. 
Uh, I should say, I, I guess in my comment, I mentioned that if you're, when the f is like a homotopy equivalence, you don't need transverse invariance of the measure, just uh, any quasi invariant measure would do. Any other questions? Yes. A weakly homogeneous, what does that mean? Oh, weakly continuous. Yeah, th I'm not saying this lemma is so hard. I'm not, I mean, this, this lemma is, this lemma is fairly, I mean, if you, once you get to know the Berry Center, if you become friends with the Berry Center, this lemma is very believable. Uh, it's not, it's like half a page or something. Uh, I just wanted to quote it. Um, so, yeah, it, it, the weak continuity, uh, well, it doesn't just follow from, I mean, you need this to be convex and there's some, I'm not sure what you mean by weak continuity. Maybe that's my problem. Uh, we, can, we can talk after. I'm not sure. Yeah, I have to find out what you mean by weak continuity. But it is just a straightforward analysis. I mean, it's not, it's not like super hard. Um, the, the foliated query formula, that's actually the most complicated part of the argument. So the, the paper's on my website. You can read it there. That's, I'll send you there for it because that's a longer argument. 